minutes, please. Okay, it's um, a real pleasure to introduce a person by starting with the phrase, she's a good in the mm. um, That's probably her uh, most important and fundamental aspect. On top of that, she uh, raised a family in Waterford. She still has a home in Waterford, although she enjoys a home in Sarasota, Florida, probably as much, if not more. Um, I came to know her very early in my career when we came here and went out for lunch once at Two Sisters Deli. And from that lunch onward, um, I knew that Dana Klein was somebody I wanted to get to know better and eventually get to work with. Um, she uh, has a master's degree from Connecticut College and she wrote about the Jewish farming community in Chesterfield, Connecticut. I ended up relying um, heavily on that thesis when I did my movie, Harvesting Stones. But I only got to do my movie, Harvesting Stones, because I got to do a movie with Donna Klein. It was really her movie, and it was called The Jews of New London. And it was um, early on when we were resettling Russian Jews. And um, all of the skills that she has, that she gained from working at the Fortunoff Archive for Holocaust Testimonies came to play uh, in the movie we made, The Jews of New London. Um, Dana uh, is... Uh, has a career um, with Yale University's Fortune of Holocaust Archives. She's a very modest person, so I only learned some of the aspects of this career lately because she's now helping me with another movie. But she was literally sent to Europe to help train interviewers right. in England. And uh, she was also instrumental in helping uh, Spielberg set up his um, archive and recordings of Holocaust survivors. Um, I hope she tells a story that will allow her to brag a little bit because she's a really remarkable person. I give you um, our neighbor, friend, and um, esteemed colleague, Donna Klein. Thank you, Jerry. I. Uh... Really appreciate those kind words, especially the first one. Uh, and I'm happy to be here tonight to tell you something about my work at the Fortune Off Video Archive. And thank you in advance, Ella, for doing the video, which will come after the formal talk. I'm calling this talk tonight, What They Remembered. Who will tell their story, the tales of survival and loss? In the Warsaw Ghetto, historian Ignacy Schipper said, quote, everything depends on who transmits our testimony to future generations. By now, much has been written about the Holocaust or Shoah in Hebrew. Writers have combed the records, lists, archives, and the secret documents. Reams have been written about what happened between the time Hitler rose to power and the Allies threw open the gates of the death and concentration camps. Just after the war ended, Dr. David Boder went into the DP camps to record the voices of those who lived through those dark years. This was the beginning of letting surviving victims speak, putting the human dimension on what happened. I wonder what Anne Frank would have said beyond, quote, I still believe in spite of everything, people are truly good at heart, unquote. Because three weeks after penning those words, she and her family were betrayed and sent to Auschwitz and eventually Bergen-Belsen, where she and her sister Margot perished. We have a testimony in the archive from somebody who also was in Belsen. This is what Renee H. said. Quote, 
My sister was being watched by the camp doctor. One day he told me that we'd be able to have oranges and chocolate if I allowed my sister to go to the hospital. She was perfectly well and I said, no, no, you're not. And so he laughed. Later, the Blockelster, a German prisoner in charge of the barracks, told me that he had hoped to do some medical research on my sister. She was deaf, unquote. Have you ever seen the photo of that young boy in the Warsaw ghetto? Fear in his eyes, arms raised as the German soldiers pointing a gun at him. Some claim to know who he was, but his identity has never been verified. But we do know that he's under 10 years old because there is no Jewish star on his coat. This photo became an icon representing the children who were lost, a whole generation not permitted to live. In the video archive, there are many testimonies about life in the Warsaw Ghetto. Listen to Helen Kay, quote, in the beginning they organized the ghetto and they pushed in all the people from the small little towns. They pushed us in, I don't know how many square blocks, and they built walls around us. You were trapped. I don't know if anybody can feel this feeling today because you know, we have so much freedom. Nobody can have this feeling of being trapped, unquote. The Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University had its beginnings in the Holocaust Survivors Film Project a grassroots effort started in 1979 in New Haven by Dr. Dory Laub, himself a child survivor and psychiatrist, along with Laurel Vlock, the television interviewer and filmmaker. With the help of William Rosenberg, another survivor, and a local survivor organization, this group began collecting testimonies from those who wish to speak about their experiences. Jeffrey Hartman, the late faculty advisor to the archive has written, quote, Yale testimonies do not expect to add to the historical body of knowledge. They wish to focus on the individual rather than the masses on each person's embodied and ongoing story, on the mind as it struggles with its memories, making sense or simply facing them, on transmitting in oral form each version of survival. There were three distinct moments when survivors were inclined to transmit to us what happened to them on the personal level. Just after the war, they tried, but few of us could hear really what they were saying. Were we feeling guilty about not doing enough to save them? Were we just not able to be sensitive to their painful experiences? This first period came to an end. They became silent and went on rebuilding their lives. Then in 1960, Eichmann was captured in Argentina and brought to Jerusalem to stand trial in 1961. Now survivors took to the stand to tell the world what they saw, what was done to them. The third phase began in 1979 with the airing of the TV show entitled Holocaust. Mr. Rosenberg and many in New Haven felt that the show didn't really tell their story. And after that, many New Haven survivors came forth to give testimony. At that time, there were 200 testimonies collected by the uh, Holocaust Video Film Project. And in 1981-2, when Bart Giamatti, the late president, Press. accepted the Election, it was deposited in the Sterling Memorial Library. The aim of testimony has always been for survivors to tell their story. 
in the language that they prefer, to bear witness. All who came did so because they wanted to be there. We never had any sort of outreach. A group of interviewers needed to be trained. So we designed a six week course. We studied interview technique, read history, memoir accounts, viewed films, and became, as Dr. Lau put it, quote, empathic listeners, a companion on this journey of memory, unquote. As an interviewer, we felt it was a privilege to hear what was spoken. We had no questions. We had no set agenda. And the interview lasted anywhere between a half hour to two hours. We asked about life before the Holocaust, how things changed, the ghetto, resettlement into labor and concentration camps. As we sat in the audiovisual studio on campus, we were taken elsewhere, to Vilna, to Kovno, to Warsaw. What we heard is difficult to describe. Later, with Ella's help, we will hear the edited version of Rabbi Baruch G. And this talk will give you a sense of how testimony goes. Again, another voice from the archive. Helen Kay, sometimes at night I lay and I, cannot, and I cannot believe what my eyes have seen. I really cannot believe it. When memory comes, it comes in fits and starts. There is no linear chronology. The studio is quiet. There is a camera. We interviewed in pairs. Time was open-ended and our questions were few. Silence was part of the telling as well. And for me, the silence that came at different junctures, having a variety of meetings was most difficult. I felt the need to fill this void with a comment or to keep the dialogue moving. Luckily, quickly, I learned this was not helpful. For really silence was part of testimony, that pause to decide what to tell, what not to tell. Later, you will hear Rabbi Baruch speaking about a family Seder, and suddenly his words are frozen in midair. Moments pass. He's talking about a Seder that happened. His father's sitting at the table, mourning because his son, Baruch, is not there. He has no idea where he is. In actuality, he was in prison at that moment, but he has had no sense of where his son is. As interviewers, we're not passive in our role as listeners. And we do need to prepare for the interview by being familiar with each person's story. A few days prior to meeting with the survivor, we complete a telephone pre-interview questionnaire designed to learn the basic threads of his or her story. We ask about where and when they were born. Were they in a ghetto, a camp, in hiding? with a resistance group. Did they witness something? Where were they at liberation? A DP camp, and where did they live after the war? Next, we read about the specific towns and camps and such to be informed to be partners in this dialogue. All of our interviews are online and available no, no. research libraries information network or Arlen. If you go to the Fortune Off Video Archive, you can access edited versions of our testimonies. In 1989, Alan Fortunoff endowed the collection in memory of his parents. Now teachers in high school and college professors routinely use edits of the interviews to expand their lectures on what Ellie Wiesel has called, quote, the kingdom of night. These are meant to supplement courses in history and literature dealing with the Shoah. In an interview, we pay particular attention to life before the war. Many speak of holidays and celebrations, 
Shabbos, Pesach, youth groups, sports clubs, and of course, anti-Semitism, as you can imagine, in its many forms. Another voice from the archive, Fred O. Quote, when I finished gymnasium, I was top of my class. I applied to two medical schools in Warsaw and Vilna. And with me, two colleagues of mine from the same class applied, both of them at the bottom of the class. They were accepted and I was refused. The irony, he adds, is that he went to France to study medicine and says those were probably one of the best five years of his life. This segment of testimony, pre-Holocaust memories, draws a picture of a lost civilization. It speaks of how Jews lived, not how they died. Again, Wiesel, quote, we speak in order not to lose it again, unquote. That is the how we lived. Zachor, remember, is a commandment fulfilled in these testimonies. Not only survivors came, we gathered testimony from liberators, those who were part of a resistance group, those who passed as Aryans, those who lived in the forest, and those who were bystanders that happened to witness things that happened in their town. I've already mentioned how silence is part of the telling. Tears are as well. But what comes to mind really is the poverty of language. We heard, quote, I can't tell you everything about the nightmares, the screaming, the tears. It's very hard to talk about this. You want to forget, unquote. Words refuse really to express the depth of despair. We say hunger, fear, Tomorrow, there was there going to be a tomorrow. Thirst, we say these words now, but they meant something different then, there. Sometimes there were stories about guilt. On a death march towards the end of the war, two brothers side by side, both weak, but one failing to keep up. As always, the German soldier pulls him out of line. He shot on the spot. The brother who remains is left with this memory. He knows there was nothing he could have done to save him. And yet he still feels he should have been able to do something. Those who reveal what happened never speak of themselves as heroes or martyrs. They are merely chroniclers of those dark years. Another theme in testimony is luck. Many say they survived by pure luck. The one brother had an ounce, an ounce more of strength than the other. Was he smarter? No. Did he appear more clever? No. He could just walk a little farther. There were times when no good choices were to be made. Eminent Holocaust scholar, Professor Lawrence Langer called these situations choiceless choices. An example, a group was hidden during the roundup in an attic. The Germans searched through the house. Suddenly the baby held in his mother's arm begins to cry. She is forced to decide what to do to expose them all or silence the baby. On occasion, in a moment seemingly out of context or in the telling of an event, the survivor begins to sing. This happens on a few occasions or sometimes we actually ask them if it seems part of the story to sing a song. Later, I will tell you what happened to these songs, really quite an extraordinary um, way of preserving them. 
As an interview seems to be coming to a close, we always ask if there's something they wish to add. This is also the time to bring out the photos and documents of their lives. It's a time when survivors quell about their children and their grandchildren. When the camera stops rolling, I always felt between two worlds. For two hours, we listened to moments of memory of loved ones, of lighthearted childhood or extreme poverty, of narrow escapes and tragic losses. And what sometimes followed was a handshake or a hug. We didn't rush this moment. We hung around letting all come back to the Yale Video Archive studio. People generally came from other cities and they wished if they wanted to, to get something to eat or have a coffee. So we also joined them. It's then that we hear things like, oh, I forgot to say this, or my goodness, how could I have forgotten to mention that? A few days later, we called the survivor to see if they had any concerns or questions. Again, it was the time to hear they wished they had remembered something. It's 40 years since the video archive became part of Yale. I wonder if Dr. Laub and Ms. Block and Professor Hartman or Mr. Rosenberg could have imagined what would become of their efforts to collect this testimony. Did they speculate how the materials would be used? This part I know for sure, the work was always meant to educate, to illuminate, the dark side. Today, the collection is well over 4,400 testimonies. Early on, the decision was made for these testimonies to be cataloged for the researchers. By 1984, Joanne Rudolph, an important part of the archive and an important person in helping us grow came on board. As our archivist, she was able to create a few projects. There are 36 of them throughout the United States. And internationally, there are projects in Israel, Europe, and South America. These projects in turn send us their work and that is how the archive grew. Ms. Rudolph also, with the help of others, arranged conferences, initiated workshops for our material, assisted numerous researchers who came to Yale study the collection. Today, there are 140 access sites worldwide. You no longer need to come to Yale to use this Last year, more than 3,977 unique registered researchers watched or listened to testimony, and they were located in 83 different countries. Stephen Naren, the current ARC, has continued to expand our work. In 2021, in order to establish a foothold in Europe, he opened an outreach office in Vienna at the Vienna Institute. Jana, hold on for just a second. Um, Colleen, okay. I, Colleen, can you please mute your microphone? I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, now, now it should work great. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see. A few years ago, fellowships were established at the archive to honor Dr. Laub, Ms. Vlock, Professor Hartman, and Mr. Rosenberg. Under Mr. Naren's direction, two podcasts entitled Those Who Are There have been produced. The third podcast will be coming out soon and will highlight the city of Vilna. Earlier, I mentioned how songs became part of testimony. There's a wonderful ensemble, the Zizel Slapovich Ensemble, that can be found on YouTube. The 
songs that are recorded there are the ones that survivors have sang during testimony. First you hear the survivors sing the song, then you hear this magnificent ensemble play the song, and finally you hear a historian describe how the song fits into the Jewish culture. It's really quite interesting and it's on YouTube should you care to find it. The third volume, Songs from Testimonies, is coming out shortly. I cannot say for sure, but I feel certain there are two individuals who know our collection best. Ms. Rudolph had been until three years ago working in the archive for 33 years. Professor Langer has been viewing our testimonies since 1984. Both occasionally conducted interviews. Langer's lifelong study of the Shoah has yielded many papers and books. Holocaust Testimonies, The Ruins of Memory was published in 1991. He wrote that based on all the testimonies that he had watched. His latest book, The After Death of the Holocaust, came out this past year. Ms. Rudolph, in conjunction with Professor Langer, has just completed a film entitled, I Am Free, But Who Is Left? It concerns a family from Ubiasha, Poland, a story of destruction and murder of a family and the Jews of that town as seen through the eyes of the brothers Orenstein. Towards the end of the film, Fred, the brother we heard of earlier who went to med school in France, says the following, quote, when I first came to this country, something shocked me. People who I met Oh, he's just come from Germany, a concentration camp. Let's not talk about it. We don't want to hear about it. People didn't want to hear our stories. But now these stories have been recorded. Let's listen. In a few minutes, Ella will let us listen to about 23 minutes of a testimony from Rabbi Baruch G, who was born in 1923 in Malawa, Poland. He was from a very religious family and he was studying in the yeshiva in Warsaw in the 30s. He talks about when the German army comes in, September 1939. In fact, those soldiers were polite, polite to disarm the citizens. There was gradual change. The Judenrat was set up. He talks about these themes, loneliness, the ghetto, resettlement, his faith, liberation, and the joylessness of that time. His thought to go to Israel, and later his relationship with his son. This video, we're not going to play it in the full 43 minutes, but you can at any point in time, go back and look up Rabbi Baruch Goldstein and you can listen to it in its entirety. So thank you for the magic from Ella and let's hope we hear from Rabbi Baruch. Born. Born in a town by the name of Malava, M L A W A, provide, having what we needed and wanted. Thinking back and. Born. Born in a town by the name of Malava, M L A W A, Poland. I would say I had a uh, very happy childhood, thinking back and to my comes moment. 
it's growing up brother one brother one sister uh, I would say a lower middle class family in terms of uh, financial status as I can think back but nothing was lacking in the house in terms of provide having what we needed and wanted remember the uh, beautiful uh, playmates and the uh, friends and uh, school classmates and school friends uh, childhood normal and uneventful but rather uh, surrounded by uh, warm family there was an isolation between Jews and Christians in my hometown you know and I try to compare it to what we have here uh, Jewish boys and girls mixing uh, in an open society with non-Jewish kids that was not my experience growing up and we went to Jewish schools we had our Jewish areas uh, we had our Jewish synagogues and uh, and frequently or occasionally at least being beaten up by a bunch of uh, Christian who called uh, Christian kids who called me a Christ killer or something of that nature uh, that was uh, so we there was we, we grew up in a kind of an isolation as far as the Jewish community is concerned Pesach was was a very joyous occasion my father sitting at the Seder really like a king <laughs> mm. which is supposed to have a connotation of freedom and this is the uh, implication when uh, the father leans on the uh, pillows and the preparation and the mother and my grandmothers was to, would come to the Seder both grandmothers uh, it seems to, not seems I know that they are my grandfathers died young both on both sides uh, before I was born so the grandmothers came to our home for, for the Seder and there were some cousins and uncles and aunts and the preparation the, uh, the joy the, the beauty of the table it was a, uh, a, an experience of a religious spiritual nature that nothing can compare of course on the other hand you have the solemn days you know of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur but really this is the uh, uh, holiday that uh, children look forward to I remember going to my grandmother's before the holiday in our days when you want matzo melt you go into the store and you buy a bake it over there my grandmother would give me nuts if I would only uh, uh, produce uh, from the matzo matzo melt so that you can make knedlach and uh, for the uh, for the goodies for, for the Passover meals but the Seder and the entire holiday was one joyous experience then you go to school and we were free all we had to do is go to the synagogue and eat and be with the family and go visitations um, it is something that it cannot be duplicated as much as we try mm -hmm. of course uh, and we do have up till this day Passover is a special special season for us in our own home but uh, I suppose what's lacking is that extended family, in my case, that's not there. And talking about extended family, I recall my son was to be bar mitzvah, and he was bar mitzvah. And there was no one on my side. Mm. Yes, my, my wife has a brother who's a rabbi too. At that time, uh, his grandfather and grandmother were alive, you know, from my mother's, my wife's side. But there was no one from my family mm. that joined. Uh, talking about that, uh, I never discussed it with my son. He never did he discuss with me, which, thinking back now, I suppose I wanted to, I cannot explain why I didn't, but all kinds of... Did I want to protect myself, not reliving it? I doubt it. I don't, I don't think this is the reason. But the fact is that uh, moments of this sort, it's a Passover or it's a, a bar mitzvah or a wedding. You're alone. Not quite, we hope, but um, loneliness 
has various various uh, aspects to it. I remember after liberation, I suffered probably more from the loneliness and the isolation more than during the Holocaust period. And I thought about it the other day, and I suppose it has to do with the fact that after life around you seems to be normal, but you are abnormal. Well, why? In concentration camps and labor camps, there was a uh, preoccupation with survival, preoccupation with being thrown around, and how can I make the next day? But then, after what was called liberation, actually the realization of liberation was not vivid with me, was not real with me for a long time. But uh, I remember during the years 45, 46, 47, even up to 48, I would find myself crying and quite frequently and feeling that there's no one, there's no one around me that cares what I do or what I don't do. And many other aspects to it that uh, I suppose has to do with loneliness. A feeling of, yes, I'm alive, but that's the, that's it. The rest doesn't matter. Uh, you're in the midst of a fire burning, and still there was a kind of a denial. I have a low come. Do you remember thinking that, or yeah. is that a thought now? Yeah, yeah, I remember thinking that. It's not as bad, somehow God will help. Not recognizing that God helps those who help themselves. Looking at it from an historical perspective. Um, although, on the other hand, one may ask, did we really have much of a choice? Which is another area. It's, 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 it's a bit complex as I see it. It's not as... Yes, historically one can say uh, Israel came into being because finally the Jews got together and decided they want to do something about it instead of waiting for God to create it for them question is whether that chance would they have had if they had done it, let's say, 200 years before that? Would they still succeed in creating what they did? Was it a question also of the, uh, the political uh, timing was more ripe in one action than another? Nobody will, never know, will ever know. But uh, uh, the fact is that uh, in my circles, a dependency on faith, I mean a lot of faith, and that God will help, was a part of the uh, psyche, of the psyche of, that, uh, that we, I was familiar with, that I identified with. Oh, we, there were bad times, we had bad times, there may be bad times, there will be bad times, somehow God will help out. The German army with their troops and their power was self-evident right away with their um, all was mechanized, it wasn't on foot as the Polish army was mostly, but rather well, well uh, the force was evident to our pleasant surprise at the moment was that the uh, first contact with German soldiers was rather a pleasant one. In what way? They did not bother us as Jews. On the contrary, they would come into the house, they would ask for drinks, they would offer them drinks, they would... And all the fear that we had accumulated for the Germans to come in, in the first few days, we didn't sense any. And I, I think, uh, I, I think this was by design, I, I would say, uh, that the... Uh, troops were not to be involved in any of the Gestapo and any of the uh, SS uh, objectives and aims. They had to do their job, to be friendly to the uh, to leave a sense of security. At least this is the way I interpret it, that the people should not to be frightened. In the first. It was only a, day, a few days after when the, they settled in the hometown, they arrested the rabbi of the community. They, meaning who? German uh, Gestapo, the, uh, 
Uh, he was arrested with a number of uh, prominent citizens and not knowing what's going to happen. And uh, they, uh, they announced that uh, if any Jew does anything wrong, these are going to be shot to death. So here is a frightening thing. Uh, then after a few days, they let them go. They're making them responsible for a number of laws which they instituted immediately after that. Not all at once, one uh, that every Jew uh, must register. Every Jew must have a number. Uh, later on, a Jew must carry a, uh, uh, must, must uh, have a, a white, first was a white round sign that he's a Jew in front and in the back. Later on, it was changed to a yellow. Uh, later on, an uh, announcement was made that a uh, Jew must uh, walk, if he sees a German, must, wa must uh, go off the sidewalk and must go in the middle of the street. A Jew must uh, take off his hat when he sees a German. German has the right to call on any Jew any time for work, any kind of work he wants to. And then, supposedly, through the representatives, which ultimately became the Judenrat, uh, they uh, issued laws that uh, every Jew, uh, 200 Jews, every day, every 200 Jews must appear in the marketplace for Germans to come in the morning to, to pick out people to work. Who chose labor. the 200 men? Pardon? Who chose the 200 men? Okay, so then this developed into a uh, numbers. First, there was by numbers. Numbers so and so must appear. Uh, that uh, almost immediately became became a uh, a source of income for some, as strange as it may seem. If someone didn't want to appear, he would ask me if I wanted to go for him. He would pay me for a day's work. In my case. Uh, my father managed to save some of his merchandise and he was able to have to carry on throughout that period. Uh, although he was caught one day and disappeared, with all of us going crazy, I remember my mother practically risked her life pleading with the German authorities there in the city hall to tried to send him back to find out where he is, uh, no avail, to no avail, except uh, after a month he came back. My father was never the same. Where had they sent him? Uh, he never talked about it. Obviously it was a labor camp of some sort. They needed him for harvesting the potatoes or whatever it was, so he worked very hard there. They cut his beard, and he he became a different different person. While I knew him to be the dynamic, all-knowing, you know, <laughs> strong, uh, he became very much reserved. Since then, although he took well care of his family, there were the five of us. My grand two grandmothers moved in with us, and one cousin of ours. So we were eight. And we stayed in the apartment. He managed to uh, do business secretly with, against the law with uh, people who came in to buy things. And they would know him, customers who knew him before. So he was able to sell some of the merchandise and provide for, for his family. Uh, food at that time, you know, it was bad when we look back. It was great. It was good. It was good. The family was together. And there was a feeling, oh, it's a war, the war will be over. And uh, there was no inclination, no idea of, a qu no question about survival. I mean, it's a, it's a question of hard times. The, this is the Sabbath day. It was the first time I had to work on the Sabbath. And since, of course, they gave us some food, but since it wasn't kosher, I wouldn't eat. Of course, I got smarter later, <laughs> unfortunately. 
but uh, to me it was a, a trauma of the worst kind. Uh, being rather a sheltered young man, uh, that was very traumatic, but thinking back on what happened afterwards, things were not so bad. So, okay, so I was beaten up. So what? Uh, talking about beating up, I, I will never forget the first time I was beaten up, and that really got to me. Not so much the, not so much the, uh, the pain from the beating, but the mental anguish. Instead of telling me how to put bricks together, I had to be placed in a certain way in order for them to be stuck up, and he simply went over and beat me for it without knowing why. <laughs> And I couldn't even cry when I came home. This is when I burst out crying. I mean, at all. They asked old Jews to appear in the marketplace there. And there were already trucks there to, to be putting us on. And, uh, and all of a sudden it stopped and they sent us back home. What happened, I don't know. Some thought that there was a... Uh, German high officer passed by and he told him to stop it. There was a lot of crying, I remember. And this is incidentally the first time I saw my father cry. They were, they were all of us standing together, embraced, and he just burst out crying. He just lost, lost his sense of, of you know, being, being a father, being a, caring for a family. That he has no power to protect his family. I remember I was still studying with the rabbi of the town, you know, privately with me. Secretly we would study. And uh, that uh, night before, one of the leaders of the Yudenrat came to tell the rabbi there that he just spoke with the authority there that to tell everybody everything's going to be fine. And the following morning, my mother was on a Friday again. My mother used to get up very early on Fridays to prepare for the Sabbath. She would go to the bakery in the morning and start preparing, and she came back and she said, to woke everybody up. That's it. But there are Germans all over town, and it's impossible to to go out without being stopped. So she backed off and came back. We lived a bit outside of the town, and uh, we were standing all the rest. There were two grandmothers with us, and my cousins, there were eight of us, each one with a ready to go. And we were hoping maybe they will not see us. We didn't know what's happening outside. So then we saw a Polish show. Uh, kid was telling the Germans, here are Jews. So they came up with dogs and whips. Whipped us out, really. Uh, something happened again, which uh, uh, is buried, but you know, when you talk that particular morning, uh, it comes to mind so vividly. My father was holding on to his mother. She couldn't run as fast as the rest of us. And I looked back, and I was in the street. It was snowing. You know. And here he was holding on to his mother. And uh, dogs attacked him, uh, with a German whipping him and his mother on the floor, on the ground, and him not wanting to go. Eventually, we were running, and uh, we were taken to a, a place. It uh, was the... Uh, it was like a uh, high school um, sports uh, place. And there were thousands of us there, and we finally looked for each other. We found my father there crying, missing his mother. And the rest of us were waiting, and after some time, they wheeled my grandmother to the group, too, on the wagon. But that group uh, consisted of about 7,000, all the Jews from the town, well, 
we cannot say, well, but most of us were there in that place. Obviously, they decided to create a ghetto there. And they uh, decided the ghetto should be only about 3,000, 3,500 Jews remaining, and the rest of us must, must be uh, evacuated. So my family together was evacuated uh, to a, uh, first we were taken to, uh, to a small village not far from my hometown. We stayed there for about 10, 11 days with a terrible humiliation. I mean, those things are forgotten. <laughs> we were in barracks there, sleeping on a bunch of straw. Feeding was once a day. Uh, humiliation of the worst kind i mean i was uh, i just couldn't couldn't deal i remember i just couldn't deal with the whole thing uh, but 11 days we were there and uh, after that we were put on uh, trains in three groups there were about three thousand of us uh, about a thousand in three different communities into uh, Poland uh, proper, which is now the Polish Protectorate. My group came to a town by the name of Lubartov, near Lublin. Mm -hmm. uh, it was after a two days travel, I guess. We arrived there on a Wednesday, I remember. The uh, Jewish community there dealt with now a thousand refugees marvelously they assigned us to different homes the three children one place with a dentist i remember my uh, cousin in a different place my father and his mother in one place and my mother and her mother a different place uh, the following day, we got together, and my grandmother died at night, mm. sitting on, her mother, on my mother's lap. You know, there was no room there to put her, so she didn't feel good. So she's on a chair of this type. They sat together and hugged each other, and uh, she just expired. Uh, but she was uh, buried that same day, and uh, looking back, I suppose she had uh, she merited to be buried like a like a human being. And two days later, my other grandmother died on a Friday. At that time, there were two other friends of mine went together. And we were caught. Um, I see Bruce Levine. <laughs> So that is a sense of what the work we do at the Video Archive. That was a testimony done in 1984. Later on, he wrote a book about his experiences. He was a rabbi in the Worcester community, much beloved. He passed away in 2017. He lived to be 94 years old, married, had a son, four grandchildren. If there are any questions that anybody has, I will try to answer them. If not, I can understand because after watching that, it's time to just think about it, I know. I think Anne Louise Shapiro has a question. Anna, yes. Can you hear me? Do you do you have any sense of whether this was the first time he had told his story, or whether he had told it before, or what it I, meant to be there at the archive for him? I do know because um, I happen to have found that online today and I never knew that he had passed away in 2017 there was an article 
And in it, it stated that three years before he came to the archive, the Worcester community asked him to give a six week course on the Holocaust. And that was the first time he ever spoke about this. He came in 1984. Uh, it happened to have been the first um, interview that Joanne participated in. She had just started to work there. And it happens to be one of the ones that stay with me all the time. So that's part of why I chose it to show. Mm -hmm. But it feels as if it were the first time. And teaching a course is much different than mm -hmm. sitting in a chair in a room with no one but a camera and two people who are interested in hearing what you have to say. So that's the best I can do to answer that question. No, thank you. It's a beautiful testimony. It's beautiful. You can see him processing things as he's going forward, which is why I asked about mm -hmm. how new it was to do that for him. Right. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Teaching and giving testimony. You're mm -hmm. a teacher. You know what that takes to teach, but quite different. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna has her hand up, I think. Ella, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Romana had her hand up. Oh, 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 okay. Hi. So, um, I just want to thank Dana and um, Joanne, who I uh, see is also with us for the amazing work that they do. I've done a lot of uh, Holocaust uh, testimonies as well, and I can't tell you what a difference survivors feel when they are with somebody who has been trained, like Dana and her crew have been trained, and know where they came from, compared to somebody just, you know, interviewing them uh, without that knowledge and how much better, how, how immensely better the quality of that testimony is compared to untrained uh, interviewers. I mean, Dana and Joanne have done amazing work and uh, 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 I've had, you know, some opportunity to interact with, uh, with Joanne and uh, um, it, it if you haven't been in it, you can't even appreciate how important their work is in the way that they interview uh, these survivors. Thank you, Romana. Bev had her hand up before. I don't see her now. Bev, you there? I don't see her. So um, now that I unmuted, I just want to share um, a few months before she passed away, my grandmother, who was Hungarian, um, my brother and my cousin actually filmed her, interviewed her. And that was the first time, it was 2006, and that was the first time she's ever spoken about her experiences in the camps, in giving her children away, um, how they managed to rebuild themselves. She just did not talk about it ever, even when we asked. But that one time she agreed and it was very powerful and meaningful, I think for everyone. So thank you. Mm. This is Larry Langer's book, Holocaust Testimonies, The Ruins of Memory. And you can still buy it on Amazon. And it's now also an online edition put out by the um, Fortunoff Video Archive. And it is in a sense illustrated with excerpts 
of the testimonies that he writes about here. Um, and he, in his writing, um, forces all of us that pay attention to this to understand the Holocaust from a different point of view, from a very different point of view. Uh, and he's actually the one who interviewed Henny Simon. So um, through Don, I've gotten to know him a little bit. I can't say that he's a happy person now. Um, I think he's frustrated and upset about the way things have uh, evolved in regard to the Shoah. But um, he's 93 and he's still sharp as a tack. And his book is still available and it's worth reading. Yeah, I worked with Larry in the early days and he was frustrated even then. He's an amazing scholar. Oh, he is. He, he has some amazing stuff to say, but he's oh. not, his views are not mainstream. No. Uh, and, and that was very frustrating for him. Right from the beginning. Um, Joanne, would it be okay if I ask you a question? Sure. Okay. So I, I, I've heard you um, speak a few times and I've met you once or twice. Um, and you always seem to uh, bring out a point of view that um, I think is important, which is that we have to remember that we're hearing the voices of survivors and we'll never hear the voices of the ones who perished. Is that on your mind all the time that it, it releases us from trying to grapple with the number of people who were murdered? I always think of the title of David Boder's book when you raise this issue. And the name of his book is I Did Not Interview the Dead. And I think of Primo Levi, who says survivors are not the ones who really experienced the ultimate, that we will never know. And there's so much that we will never know. Um, I do want to comment on one thing that you did say, Jerry, and I wasn't going to say it, but now that you asked me a question, Larry Langer may not be happy about the kitsch and the popularization of the Holocaust as a redemptive experience, but he is a happy person. He has children and grandchildren. He has a very fulfilling life. He has the best sense of humor. He's not a nihilist. He's a realist. And he is a very happy person. He's good company and very funny. That's good to know. <laughs> That's very good. He to is. Know. He's a wonderful. I love his company. He's great to be with. I hope to be with him soon. Nice. Thank you, Dan, so much for this. It was fascinating. We really appreciate it. And um